good evening, good evening uh, respected colleagues and uh, teachers um, i would like to invite you all for this uh, um, session on uh, diabetic macular edema so we have a host of speakers uh, who have their own forte in uh, you know managing cases and the expertise so without wasting much of our time so let us start uh, with our presentation i think uh, jacob are you our first uh, presentation for the day is a clinical trial in uh, diabetic macular edema and what they mean in real world um, it's none other than dr jacob uh, who is my colleague uh, from uh, my alumnus um, that's rp center so if i have to look at uh, for someone who has all the studies in the fingertips it could be dr jacob so i invited him for this talk so uh, can we have his video yes sir yeah please um i would request uh, everybody to open since uh, it's a tight schedule uh, shall we do the small amount of discussion after every talk otherwise we'll forget about what's the talk about opinion uh, pradeep hello and welcome to the session yeah that's better sir yeah that's better thank you sir play 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 sir past on 2021 i thank the organizers for giving me this opportunities and most of all i thank you your presence here means so much to us i'll be discussing the clinical trials in diabetic macular edema and their implications in real life please give me a minute while i start my presentation Diabetic macular edema is a condition with a complex multifactorial pathogenesis with multiple multimodal image imaging and multiple treatment options. And just give me a minute while I minimize that. Yes, thank you. All of this which needs to be discussed within 10 minutes. So instead of going through every trial in detail, I'll just discuss the parts that are feel pertinent to real life practice when we see a patient like this the dr and dme we do a bit of of investigations most important being hpa1c we've been long told by many people that we need to get the hpa1c under control before we treat diabetic macular edema however this can be counterproductive because as we know a single point reduction in hpa1c is associated with an increase in the odds of progression of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema so the treatment of diabetic macular edema and the treatment of diabetes especially in those patients with high uh, hpa1c should be started in tandem however in the long run the dcct proved that it is very important to reduce the hpa1c because a 10% reduction in hpa1c was result, resulted in a re reduced progression of diabetic retinopathy less diabetic retinopathy means less diabetic macular edema and that is our long term goal the other investigation that we do is oct and we shall come back to it later but at this point of time we just need to say talk about the clinical correlation between macular thickness and vision 100 microns of increase in edema is associated with approximately one line of visual loss oct is also used to assess the response to treatment but i'll get back to that in detail later the first clinical trial which was considered the gold standard treatment uh, trial for diabetic macular edema was etdrs but as the name suggests it was included early patients with early diabetic retinopathy so it meant it focused on preserving vision rather than improving vision and this has long led to the idea that laser does not cause visual gain however a subset analysis of patients with poor vision showed that 30% of patients gained 10 letters so part of the reason for this uh, lack of gain in the main group is because of the inclusion criteria most of the patients had good vision and therefore had little to gain on the basis of this the dhdrcrn modified the etdrs grid 
to make it less damaging with less power, less duration and wider spacing. This is the pattern and the protocol that will be used in conjunction with the other agents in the future. This is the mainstay of the treatment of diabetic macular edema, intravitreal injections. As you can see, there are multiple injections with multiple trials, with multiple protocols, with varying inclusion criteria, giving a patchwork of trials such as read one, two, three, rise, ride, restore, reveal, all for anagizumab, vivid and vista for aflip Recept, bolt for and for bevacizumab and innumerable DRCRL protocols, A, B, C, and F, and so on. The conclusions I'd like to draw from all these studies is that they included patients from vision of six by nine or less up to three by 60. And this gives us a good idea on whom to, to treat with diabetic macroidema. We must remember that minimum of three monthly injections was given as a loading dose in all trials. Many of them gave six months at the very least and monthly visits with OCT are required. And obviously lifelong follow-up is required because diabetic macular edema may be controlled, but like diabetic epilepsy, it never goes away. Let's just deep dive into the RCR and protocol I, which compared prompt laser, ranibizumab with prompt laser, ranibizumab with deferred laser, and trimsulone with, with prompt laser. As you can see in this, the, the uh, patients with prompt laser and deferred laser had good visual outcomes, whereas the initial trimestrial group showed an improvement in vision, which actually dropped below those who were lasered alone. However, most of these patients were of middle age or older, and an analysis of the pseudophagic patients shows that IVTA was actually very good. It, it was better than ranibizumab at certain points. It continued to be slightly better than ranibizumab with prompt laser, even at the end of 104 weeks. In conclusion, vision was better in the subgroup with deferred laser. So laser is better to be kept for those who are not responding. Visual outcomes of a three letter, three line visual gain was better in deferred laser. However, the number of injections were fewer with those who are lasered early. It is important to note that in year four and five, 50% did not require any injections at all. And something that is not stressed on enough is that IVT had comparable results in pseudophagic patients. A quick look at the Vivid and Vista trials will show that 40% of the patients had a three line gain in vision. This could be either with the monthly protocol or the bi-monthly protocol after five loading doses of aflimacid. I mark that out in red because it is important that the loading doses of aflimacid be given monthly, which was much better than the laser or crossover arm. Looking at these results, the DRCRN started its landmark protocol T, which compared bevacizumab, ranibizumab, and aflimacid. In the overall subset, there was not much of a difference between all the patients. But in patients with poor vision, that is 20 by 50 or worse, we can see that aflibercept did better than either anabizumab or bevacizumab, which were equal to each other. On the basis of this, we could suggest that aflibercept be selected in patients who with poor vision and a lot of edema. It also gave us an important criteria on how to assess response improvement was, was uh, defined as a 10% fall in central macular thickness or a five letter or one line improvement in vision. Stability was less than 10% change in macular thickness or less than one line change and worsening was it more than 10% increase in edema or a decline of one line. It also defined success as six by six and a central subtle thickness of 250 or less. It also defined went to laser on the basis of the DRCR protocol I, it showed so it that deferred laser had better outcomes. It suggested that we do laser for those patients who did not respond to two injections of anti vegf one month apart. It also recommended that we give an, do an FFA before doing the laser and classified leaks into focal leaks, which can explain one more than two-thirds of the edema 
indeterminate leaks where the microaneurysms can explain between one third to two third of the edema and diffuse leaks where the microaneurysms can only explain less than one third of the edema. It suggested that we do the modified ETDR grid for the diffuse leak, whereas focal laser for the focal leaks. This can be better brought to understanding by looking at a case study. This patient, which is typical for many DNA patients, had a central subfield thickness of 630 with a vision of 20 by 80. After one injection, it, the central subfield thickness improved to 550, but the vision remained the same. Therefore, it is considered as improvement. On the second injection, although the OCT showed no change, vision had improved by more than one line, and therefore it was classified as improvement. After the third injection, both macular edema and the vision had improved. After the fourth injection, we can see that neither the macular edema nor the vision had improved, and this was considered stable. One more injection showed the same result, but injections were given because a minimum of six months of injections was recommended. Thereafter, focal laser was done because of lack of improvement to two consecutive injections. And when the patient worsened again, he was given injections until he improved to 20 by 20 and less than 250, which is considered success. It is important to know that after the first success, we give one more injection. Thereafter, we, we can defer the patient and follow up the patient monthly, by monthly, then at a minimum of every four months thereafter. Yeah. In, um, in conclusion of the final pathway for treating DME with anti -vegifs. it is important to give anti early because little edema responds better than a lot of edema. There are also more options mm. than edema is mild. Injections need to be given monthly for at least three months, preferably six. We must set expectations, therefore, because the median number of injections in the first year was nine. 50% of the patients will require laser. I phrased it in such a way because it is important to know that laser is required for very many patients. And in fact, DME cannot be managed in a large scale clinical practice without doing some laser. We have to wait for resolution of edema before shifting to PR and dosage, and a lifelong follow up is required. A quick word on Ozodex. Ozodex was, was uh, studied under the MEAT trial. And in the general subset, you can see in the first graph, vision dropped after a few months of visual gain to a, at points below the sham even, and then gain thereafter. This was primarily because of cataractogenesis between the months 18 and 24. In the pseudophagic subgroup, you can see that vision was maintained throughout the study period. Another important point is that need included patients who were not mostly treatment naive. Although we consider that um, follow-up is not required so much in Ozodex, it is important to note that because of glaucoma and cataractogenesis, every six weeks, the patient needs to follow up for IOP check because up to 30% of patients required uh, anti-glaucoma medications and 60% developed cataract. A good percentage, however, responded with a three-line visual gain. In conclusion, steroids are often considered second line because of the high incidence of cataract and glaucoma, but it can be considered as a first-line therapy in pseudophagics when associated with early focal laser. And a, follow, a, a strict follow-up is required. It's not a fire-and-forget uh, molecule because glaucoma risk is high. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I look forward to your feedback in. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, I think uh, nobody could have done a much, uh, you know, concise job than, you know, putting all those studies together. So one thing that uh, I wanted uh, some amount of clarification from you. So you said that uh, once we wait for the HP1C to tank down, uh, there is definitely an increase in you know, macular edema and retinopathy. So what, what are we supposed to do in such a situation? Do we continue to give the injection or uh, we wait? Um, we shouldn't wait. That's what, that's what was the a message that you wanted to give across, isn't it? 
Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for that question. Yes, I think uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, treatment should be started simultaneously. Uh, HPA1C should be brought under control, but that is not something that we need to wait for for uh, initiating treatment. Uh, so we would like to just, uh, while we acutely bring the patient under control, we would also like to start giving anti probably anti first, and then if the patient has PDR, once edema settles, to do a PRP as well. Thanks. Um, anybody else has any other doubts or clarifications that needed? Yeah, sir, uh, that was a nice presentation. I just wanted to know how frequently would you want to get the blood sugars checked by your patients? when you are treating the, uh, for uh, DME. Thank you for that question. Uh, normally, we would, I just get my HbA1c tested. Uh, on the date of the injection, I also get my get a random sugar because there is a VRSI guideline that suggests that RBA should be less than 200 on the day of giving the injection. Uh, but otherwise, I just get an HbA1c done every three months. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Okay, for the uh, lack of you know time, so we'll just uh, go on to the second talk of the day. That's role of OCTA in uh, diabetic retinopathy. So it's none other than Dr. Pradeep Sagar, uh, who is a mastermind uh, working on OCTA all the time. Um, uh, Mahesh uh, talks to him as it's his own girlfriend. So Pradeep, uh, can you start uh, sharing it? Or if there's a video, please kindly share. Yes, thank you. Good evening, my Outset, I would like to thank Costco, Dr. Mahesh and Mugam sir, and Dr. Rajesh for giving me this opportunity. I will be discussing the OCTA findings in diabetic retinopathy and clinical utility of OCTA in diabetic retinopathy. Coming to the OCTA findings in vitreous, in patients with non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the vitreous will not show any finding, whereas in patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, as the new vessels grow from the surface of retina into the posterior cortical vitreous, we see the new vessels in the vitreous lab. Here we can see that we see irregular vascular network overlaying the disc and in the nasal part of the retina, which is neovascularization at disc and neovascularization elsewhere respectively. Coming to the superficial capillary plexus, in cases with both non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we see presence of microaneurysms, capillary dropout as flow-void areas, tortuous capillaries, and enlargement of the foveal vascular zone, and distortion if there is macular ischemia. The other findings include presence of abnormal capillary loop and even neovascularization elsewhere. We discussed that the neovascularization is seen in the vitreous lab. Here we can see that in the OCTA B scan, the neovascularization is seen as a flow signal in the vitreous, whereas it is also seen in the superficial capillary plexus as a projection artifact because the projection artifact removal function is not applied to the superficial capillary plexus. Moving on to the deep capillary plexus, we see enlargement of foveal vascular zone. In this image, we can see that in the deep capillary plexus, the foveal vascular zone area is larger than the superficial capillary plexus. We also see presence of microaneurysms. In the chorio capillary slab, we see presence of flowoid areas, which are seen as dark areas. This indicates that the chorio capillary flow is also impaired in diabetic retinopathy and the effect of it on diabetic retinopathy still needs a clear understanding. But when we assess chorio capillaries on OCTA, we should always look at the end phase OCT of the choroidal slab. Here we can see that this is the end phase OCT. Here we see there are numerous dark spots which are corresponding to the hard exudates on color photograph. These dark spots are due to hypotransmission or shadowing so that it doesn't allow the light to reach the choroid. So in this particular area, whatever dark areas we are seeing would be partly due to hypotransmission and may not be a true flow void area. Whereas here we can see that there is presence of flow void area which is seen as a dark signal and does not correlate with any dark signals on OCT in phase choroidal slab. Microaneurysms are an important finding in diabetic retinopathy. 
the rate of detection of microaneurysm on OCTA compared to FFA is controversial. Some studies have shown that the rate is similar. Some studies have shown it to be higher and some studies have shown it to be lower. Coming to this particular example, here we see that there is a large aneurysm which is responsible for macular edema and we can see hard exudates in the peripobial area. Whereas the corresponding superficial capillary plexus doesn't show any vascular signal. But we can see a few microaneurysms in the peripobial area. This is mainly because OCTA can detect a vascular flow within a certain velocity range. If the flow is higher or lower than that particular range, OCTA will not be able to detect that particular vascular structure. There are other OCTA indices which are described in diabetic retinopathy, including the vascular density, oval vascular zone A circularity index, oval vascular zone area, intercapillary spacing, vessel diameter index. These indices are noted to be affected even in preclinical diabetic retinopathy. And it is noted that the changes correlate with the severity of diabetic retinopathy. Among them, only the vascular density is available as a measure on automated software. So it is noted that the vascular density is lower in diabetic guys even without diabetic retinopathy and it is negatively correlated with the DR severity and visual acuity. In this image, we can see that this is the vascular density map where there is reduction in vascular density in the peripopial area. Coming to the clinical utility of OCTA, as I already discussed, in cases with preclinical diabetic retinopathy, OCTA helps in detection of a few vascular abnormalities like the areas of capillary dropout, decrease in vascular density, changes in foveal vascular zone, and impairment of the choreocapillary flow. So this indicates that OCTA helps in predicting the development of diabetic retinopathy. Macular ischemia, OCTA plays a very important role in identification of macular ischemia by non-invasive means. Here we can see that there is enlargement and distortion of foveal vascular zone confirming the diagnosis of macular ischemia. In, when it comes to macular ischemia, a small field is better than a wide field. For example, here we can see that in a 9mm scan, the foveal vascular zone is not very well seen. Whereas in a 3mm scan, we can see the foveal vascular zone well and we can also see presence of a flow void areas in the peripobial area. Coming to macular edema, it helps in assessment of foveal vascular zone in macular edema. So we can identify whether a patient with macular edema has an associated macular ischemia. The superficial capillary plexus will not be affected by edema. So SCP can be used to assess the status of foveal vascular zone. Here we can see that despite a severe edema, there is no significant effect on the foveal vascular zone and we can see that the foveal vascular zone is relatively preserved. But the segmentation artifacts can lead to a misinterpretation of findings. As we can see over here, it appears as if there is an enlarged foveal vascular zone, but this is mainly due to a poor segmentation, which we can see on a OCTA B scan. It shows that the segmentation is improper. Secondary to which we see that there is a flow void area in the center and it is difficult to come to a conclusion whether this patient has macular ischemia or not. With the current understanding, OCTA does not have a major clinical utility in terms of therapeutic decision in macular edema. Moving on to OCTA in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it helps in identification of subtle neovascularization at disc. Here we can see that there is a vascular network which is very well confirmed on OCTA B scan where we can see a flow signal in the vitreous which is also confirmed on an in phase OCTA. When we have a lesion which is suspicious, it is always better to use a small field better than a wide field. Here 
we are suspecting a neovascularization at disc. When we took a 12 mm scan, here we can see that there is a possible vascular network, but it is not very convincing. Whereas a 4.5 mm scan shows the presence of a vascular network with doping, which confirms the presence of neovascularization at disc, which is also seen as a flow signal in the vitreous cavity on OCTA B scan. It helps in assessment of response to therapy. This is an example of a case prior to panretinal photocoagulation where we can see presence of neovascularization at disc. Six weeks after treatment with panretinal photocoagulation, we can see that there is an increase in the area of neovascularization, which indicates that it needs further laser. This is another example prior to anti up therapy where we can see presence of neovascularization at disc. After anti up we can see that there is a complete regression of neovascularization. So if you are treating a patient of PDR with anti up alone, OCTA helps in deciding the retreatment. Coming to the limitations, motion artifacts decreases the image quality. The segmentation errors can lead to misinterpretation of findings. 12 mm is also a relatively small field when it comes to diabetic retinopathy because it is significantly lesser when compared to the fluorescent angiography. Montage and extended field imaging with best 20D lens are employed to obtain a wide field, but it would be difficult to apply in clinical practice. So availability of a wide field OCTA may help in identification of neovascularization and capillary dropout area even in mid-periphery and periphery and then only it may have a role in replacing fluorescent angiography. So at the current moment, most of the findings what we are detecting on OCTA is mainly restricted to posterior pole and slightly around the arcade. So a wide field OCTA would be required to expand the use of OCTA in diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. An excellent uh, compilation of cases, uh, Pradeep. Uh, it was a thought of working process like even I haven't seen, uh, though I haven't reviewed much of such cases in my uh, clinical practice. Uh, anybody has any questions to be asked? Thank you, sir. Um, if not, then we'll go to the next talk. Uh, that's the keynote address by another than my teacher and mentor, Dr. Mahesh, sir. Um, we are all here as retina surgeons. It's only because of him. Sir, uh, can you upload, uh, admin, can you please upload the uh, video of sirs? Hello. Um, this, is not Vishal, this is not the thing. Vishal, can you change to uh, Mahesh, sir's presentation? Just a topic, just Vishal, uh, could you locate it or? Yeah. Let's look at the role of vitrectomy in the treatment of diabetic macular edema in the next few minutes. Here is a clinical example of a patient who underwent multiple intravitreal injections of anti vgf agents and steroids but kept coming back with recurrent edema. OCT much more carefully and we found that there was an epiretinal membrane. So if there is a vitreomacular interface disorder in diabetic macular edema, they may respond initially but they may respond suboptimally. In such a situation, vitrectomy would be the treatment of choice. So here we see a patient who is undergoing vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema. This patient does not have proliferative diabetic disease. And we can see that the epiretinal membrane is not obvious at all. So we use a needle to create an opening. And once we have created an opening, we can see such an extensive epiretinal membrane which was invisible is being peeled off. And subsequently, we stain the internal limiting membrane with brilliant blue G and then remove the internal limiting membrane carefully. When we do internal limiting membrane removal in patients with diabetic macular edema, we need to be particularly careful not to de-roof the cystoid space 
which may be at the fovea. Sometimes one may have to do a fovea sparing internal limiting membrane removal as well in these patients. Following the surgery, we find that the internal fluid has resorbed and for the first time the foveal contour has come back. Though it is not a normal foveal contour, there is widening of the foveal contour. In addition, the damage has already been done. You can see the disorganization of inner retinal layers. So long-standing edema before we intervene could have resulted in permanent changes which may make the visual recovery a bit suspect in these patients. And these patients may need subsequent medical treatment as well because we have taken care of only one component which is the traction but then the vascular component which is the reason for the diabetic macular edema may persist in these patients needing additional treatment. This study showed the long-lasting benefits of vitrectomy in treating tractional diabetic macular edema. Patients did not need any intravitreal injections for the next 24 months post vitrectomy and the central macular thickness continued to regress over the next 24 months. Presence of diabetic macular edema along with proliferative diabetic retinopathy is a little bit of a different ball game. In proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there is breakdown of the blood, breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. So the posterior hyaloid becomes thickened in addition, there could be associated epiretinal membranes and internal limiting membrane, which continue to cause traction over the macula. And this traction may not be obvious. As you can see in this fundus photograph, there is extensive exudation in the macular region, but we don't see an obvious epiretinal membrane. Because the thickened hyaloid is kind of globally attached over the posterior pole and can cause a generalized traction over the posterior pole which results in this extensive exudation and extensive protein deposits, lipid deposits in the macula. So this is the OCT, you can see how adherent the posterior hyaloid is. So in a patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diffuse diabetic macular edema, I am a bit more liberal in performing an earlier vitrectomy. So here we see an example of a proliferative diabetic retinopathy with diffuse macular edema that is a thickened posterior hyaloid so it is here it is a bit obvious so we are incising it with a needle then peeling it off gently as you can see there are focal areas of dense attachment particularly over the papillomacular bundle so the hyaloid is peeled towards that area of attachment taking care not to damage the retina beneath this focal attachment so these were days when I was not using BBG, so we are trying to figure out where the internal limiting membrane is. So and that epiretinal membrane slash internal limiting membrane is carefully identified and removed. We can see the results after the surgery. After removing the posterior hyaloid as well as the thickened internal limiting membrane and epiretinal membrane, as the fluid gets absorbed, there is precipitation of the hard objects at the macula which go away slowly and this is the net result. In tractional diabetic macular edema, in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, this is one such example, the epiretinal membrane causing the diabetic macular edema can be part of this proliferation which is along the posterior hyaloid. So when we take care of the traction retinal attachment, the proliferation causing the traction retinal attachment, then the second membrane, which is prop, which is the one which is extending across the macula and causing macular edema, can also be carefully identified and removed. And the traction may not be always on the macula. As we saw in this previous video, the epiretinal membrane was right over the macula. But the traction can be along the arcades and a subtle second membrane can be extended towards the macula, towards the fovea, exerting traction. So this can be identified by fine striae, which can be visible on the slit lamp examination. For instance, here you can see the proliferation is along the inferior temporal arcade, but there is cystoid macular edema, and this proliferation along the arcade is causing this traction, which can be identified as fine striae of the internal limiting membrane. So once we find this appearance, this patient is not going to do well with just, just with intravitreal injections, and a vitrectomy removing this traction and that second membrane which is overlying the macula is the one which will help regress the diabetic macular edema. 
You can see in the blown up image, you can see that this thickened hyaloid is the one which is causing the diabetic macking back. So do we peel internal limiting membrane in patients undergoing vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema? So why do we peel them? Because the internal limiting membrane is also not normal in diabetic macular edema and that can be thickened and continue to exert traction. To relieve this traction and in addition leaving behind the internal limiting membrane can increase the risk of a second epineutral membrane formation which can continue the process of traction on the macula. So to decrease these risks, we can peel the interlimiting membrane. But then there was a meta-analysis just published in 2015, which found that in patients who undergo vitrectomy with internal limiting membrane peel, and those who did not undergo internal limiting membrane peel, there was just about two letter difference. So for this two letter difference, would we want to do an internal limiting membrane peel? And this study also showed that there was no difference in central macular thickness reduction or central macular thickness post vitrectomy between these two groups, one undergoing ILM peeling, the other one not undergoing ILM peeling. The caveat was that most of the studies which were quoted in this meta-analysis were, were quoting results less than a year old. In addition, they went on to say that the retinal sensitivity post internal limiting membrane peeling was lost even two months after the post ILM peeling and the ERG took time to recover after ILM peeling. In patients who did not undergo ILM peel, the ERG recovery that began in about six weeks. In contrast to those who had the ILM peeling done, the recovery started only six months later. In addition, they also found that irregularities and indentations on the inner surface of the retina thinning of the temporal retina, inner retinal dimpling, transit reduction of the retinal differential light threshold. So does that mean that we should not peel ILM in patients with diabetic macular edema? I would think the benefits outweigh the risks and I would peel the internal limiting membrane for fear of leaving behind some amount of traction, leaving the ILM in place and also the fear of a recurrent epineutral membrane. This is corroborated by a subsequent meta-analysis which is published in 2018, here they looked at 14 studies and overall of 857 eyes and they found that vitrectomy and ILM peeling did improve best corrective visual acuity and central macular thickness reduction. So I would a surgical example of a patient undergoing ILM peeling, the patient has proliferated diabetic retinopathy and after dissecting the fibrovascular proliferation, there is some amount of active bleeding on the surface of the retina, which also makes the process of peeling the ILM difficult, and there is hardly any staining of the ILM. So sometimes it can happen like this in diffuse diabetic macular edema, where the ILM doesn't stain too well. So finally we managed to identify one area of the ILM being nicked off, and then we used that as a handle to peel the ILM. So, so far we have been saying that vitrectomy with the epiretinal membrane removal and ILM removal does help in, uh, in treating tractional diabetic macular edema. But in contrast to all this, there is a study which found that in patients, even with vitreomacular traction anomalies, we can continue to give anti vegf And this study found that there was no difference in the central macular thickness between the groups at six months. And in fact, the intravital injection eyes had better vision. This was a study of 40 patients and at six months follow up. So I would still treat the patients with vitreomacular anomalies and diabetic macular edema with vitrectomy, particularly if they don't respond adequately to intravital injections. So, so far we have been looking at vitrectomy in tractional edema. So what about vitrectomy in non-tractional edema? So vitrectomy has been proposed to improve oxygen concentration in the vitreous by removing antioxidant ascorbate. This improves oxygenation. ILM thickened in diabetic macular edema, which when we remove helps oxygenation as well. Increased oxygenation results in vasoconstriction and this decreases the diabetic macular edema. And vitrectomy may also downregulate wedge of secretion, removes vasoactive and vasodamaging factors and also improves peripheral capillary blood flow. So unresponsive diabetic macular edema with traction, currently what do we do? We treat them with, continue to treat them with anti-VEGF or switch over to steroids. 
we may add focal and grid laser laser to ablate peripheral capillary non perfusion areas so is there a role for vitrectomy earlier studies have shown that post vitrectomy in these patients who do not have traction but have persistent macular edema the central macular thickness goes down but there is no associated improvement in vision though the cmt decreases there is no visual improvement This is a clinical example of a patient who had persistent macular edema and uh, after vitrectomy you can see the macular edema is gone. There is a recent study which looked at the role of vitrectomy in treating treatment naive diabetic macular edema. This is a study of 44 patients and they found that like more than 50% of the patients had more than 3 line best character visual acuity improvement post vitrectomy. The DME record only in about 7% of the eyes and this was without any intravitreal injection. The prognostic factors for vision improvement post vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema are ILM peeling, presence of vitreous macular anomalies which are removed during the surgery such as apparatal membrane removal, get a baseline macular thickness, intact ELM, presence of subretinal fluid and non cystoid edema, no prior macular laser photocoagulation, lower HbA1c and worse baseline visual acuity are associated with good improvement post vitrectomy. Complications of vitrectomy in the 20 gauge era are retinal tears, regmatous RD, neovascular glaucoma, recon vitreous hemorrhage, lamellar, full thickness macular hole, apparatal membrane formation, hard exit, the hard exit back of the fovea. But these are not that common with the newer surgical equipment. So, do we do early vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema? Both anti vitreous therapy and vitrectomy do result in a dry macula, but then there are better visual outcomes with anti vitreous treatment. Vitrectomy probably does not give rise to good visual recovery, probably because we intervene too late. Both are associated with their own complications, and ophthalmitis can happen in anti therapy, and vitrectomy can cause cataract, and retinal attachment is always a risk which is there with vitrectomy. Durability anti of course, we have to keep repeating multiple times. Vitrectomy, if it works, there's a possibility that the durable effect of the treatment can be long lasting. Of course, vitrectomy works out to be less expensive in contrast to antivagin therapy. But in the current current scenario, I, we are not. I'm not too sure if we are ethically correct to treat non-traction diabetic macular edema with vitrectomy, and we usually prefer vitrectomy for traction macular edema. To summarize, we need to always rule out traction in diabetic macular edema before initiating medical treatment, or if the patient has not responded adequately to medical treatment. Vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema with thought posterior hyaluronic epimacular membrane as well as the PMP traction. Vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema without traction, the role of it is as yet unclear. At the present moment, we resort to this in recalcitrant cases with limited visual recovery. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir, for elaborating all the indications for vitrectomy in DME. Uh, so, uh, would you consider in non-traction cases, would you look at the uh, subhyaloid bursa and then, um, you know, uh, those subset of patients, would you like to do vitrectomy as of now? As I mentioned, if the patient has got a proliferative diabetic retinopathy, probably I would consider doing that uh, as an option. But the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with the diabetic macular edema, I would probably consider giving only anti of injections or steroids. And if the patient is not responding adequately, only then I may consider. Otherwise, vitrectomy at the present moment is the last option in these situations. Okay. Uh, anybody else has anybody to uh, anything to ask? Huh? Yeah. Can I have sir, a question? another meeting? Yes, yeah. not, sir. please go ahead. Good evening, sir. It's always a feast for eyes and you have to watch your videos and... So I just wanted to know, uh, are there any uh, obesity findings where we can find uh, to do a, a foveal sparing uh, ILM peeling or uh, to uh, peel the ILM over the fovea? Because what I have observed most of the times is after the surgery, like after this ILM peeling, they go for foveal thinning. I don't know whether that's mainly related to my surgical uh, trauma or uh, something else uh, is there. So I just wanted to know whether there are any uh, thing which we can decide pre -op so that we can uh, do a foveal sparing uh, ILM peel in uh, diabetic macular edema. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manjinath, for the kind word. Yeah, it's just a question of thinning and how big the cyst is in the central part. So if the cyst is fairly large and the inner layer, what we see seems to be thin, is when I would probably, as a prophylactic measure, leave the ILM in place. 
But I haven't found that to be too much of an issue as well because sometimes we think that we want to leave the ILM in place and then and as we keep peeling the ERM, it comes off, it peels off and doesn't all the time happen to de-roof the foveal cyst. So the way we attack the problem is how I think it decreases the risk of foveal de-roofing. So if you come from all around and then the period of tangentially probably doesn't peel off. So I am not aware of any OCT findings except for this thinning. I'm not too sure if Pradeep or somebody else has gone through this to come up with uh, any other futures which can say that this particular phobia may do roof. Pradeep, you want to take it up? As such, uh, like, uh, no specific uh, observations are like, uh, like it could be more prone to de-roofing. I'm not very sure about it. But maybe like what you are telling, like the thinning and the thinning of the inner layer of the system. That would be inner wall of the system would be a more uh, uh, relevant uh, finding, but uh, not very sure about anything else. So better to uh, do an fovea sparing island peeling if there is a, a huge edema at the subfovial region. Yeah, previously, like what during uh, our uh, uh, fellowships and all, what we used to thought is we used to inject uh, uh, like prior IVTA before doing uh, surgery. So there was one, I, I don't know, operate, uh, yeah, stopped, uh, might be because of uh, our uh, surgical skills or maybe improvement of the uh, uh, instrumentation. Uh, whether I, uh, sometimes I feel that would be better, like uh, prior uh, surgery, we can just uh, go ahead and inject some amount of IVT and then wait for a week so some edema might come down. So uh, just uh, I think that there would be some beneficial. I think we are more worried about the side effects of uh, tricot in these patients, isn't it, Manasa? Uh, so maybe that's the reason why the practice has come down. I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so we'll get go ahead with the next talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh, and I'm sorry that I'm unable to be here and continuing the session because I have to go to another session. Uh, I think it, what Dr. Manjunath was trying to say is like give the injection and the edema goes down and then you can go ahead safely operate. That may also be a good option. Probably we have to do cut it down. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, sir, um, Raju sir has asked a question. After how many injections in the case of VMA without any traction should one conserve it? I think that was directed to sir. Uh, sorry, sir, sir has uh, probably left. I'm still um, here only. Sir, sir, VMA, sir, 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 sir. <laughs> VMA, I would probably like, if the sister edema doesn't go down, then I will probably switch the agent to another steroid and say, if it still doesn't come down, then probably I may consider vitrectomy. But that also, if the vision is poor, because right now, vision of 6, 9, 6, 12, probably I would not even intervene, continue the same injections, because there's a lot of confusion about when you should switch. So, in addition, adding a vitrectomy is also not a great idea. If it's PDR, maybe I will. But if it's only NPDR with DME, 6, 9 vision, I will probably continue giving the injection or switch to another agent. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manjunath, sir, just wanted to ask, like, if IVTA was just to decrease the uh, CME uh, so that we can safely yeah. peel the ILM, uh, we can do that with anti vegf also. The response is much earlier, isn't it? Um, is there any uh, yeah, reason no, why you think IVTA would be better? The, correct. No, no that's uh, mainly to, we thought, like, inflammatory uh, uh, pathway was the one which uh, we feel in chronic uh, DMs. So that was the reason behind which we studied uh, using IVTA prior to surgery, might be one week or two okay. weeks. Some, but okay. it, it's again, it's very controversial. Some patients, it works, some patients. Okay. So, without wasting much time, so let's go to the next talk that is on you know, recalcit recalcitrant uh, DME. Uh, to put more light into that topic, uh, I invite Dr. Manjunath. Manjunath, sir, is um, a senior surgeon from uh, working at Ganesh Netrala and Sirsi. So, sir has vast experience in uh, treating diabetic macular edema um, and diabetic patients. So, sir, let us uh, hear from you, sir. Thank you. Admit, can you, Vishal, can you please upload the video? At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity. The topic given to me is uh, recalcitrant diabetic macular edema. I hope uh, my slides are visible and I am audible. I was trying to find the word meaning of recalcitrant. What I found is uh, having an obstinately uncooperative attitude towards authority or discipline is known as uh, recalcitrant. So the management of a diabetic macular edema is nowadays is more like a roller coaster drive. Whenever there is a 
increase in edema, decrease in visual acuity, we tend to treat. And whenever there is a decrease in edema, we tend to observe. It's more like a emotional roller coaster drive for a patient as well as a doctor. So this is the layout of our presentation, which I'm going to present today. So DME is one of the leading cause of vision loss. anti have become a first line of therapy in management of diabetic macular edema. DRCA.net protocol has showed that more than 40% of the patient who received the ranibizumab did not achieve a complete resolution of macular edema. The challenging to treat because of the complex underlying uh, physiological processes, and we lack uh, prospective randomized clinical trial, particularly on uh, recalcitrant uh, DMEs. So these are the various branches of a decision tree. So coming to treatment option, which currently we have are anti steroids, laser photocoagulation, and surgery. So what is the definition of a refractive DME or refractive patient? Any patient that after a three loading loads, that means after a three consecutive monthly injection, who showed no improvement in visual acuity, that means more than a five letter improvement in ETDRS chart, or less than 10% reduction of uh, central foveal thickness measured on uh, OCT. With a chronic DME, according to Bressler, those highs who did not achieve a uh, central uh, subfoveal thickness of less than 250 microns, a uh, more than 10% reduction on at least two consecutive visits can be called as a chronic DME. According to DRCA.net uh, panel, even after uh, receiving a three anti of uh, injections, a non-response would be a persistent or worsening of uh, DME, no improvement in functional or anatomical outcome can be considered as a chronic DME. This is a pathophysiology of a diabetic macular edema. So what are the points you consider whenever you're managing a patient with a DME is up to the baseline visual equity is very important. Duration of a DME, the ocular environment and local pathological changes like any presence of a peritoneal membrane, vitreal metal attraction, and systemic factors. So treatment of chronic DME has become more difficult nowadays. Uh, some of the good things is like we understood the disease better and better technologies are available to visualize uh, macular edema. And we have more treatment options. So the bad things are like our treatment uh, do not work sometimes and uh, edema remain uh, refractory. So what are the questions you get in uh, real life is how to decide on uh, which treatment for which patients, are there any safety concerns for uh, DME treatment? So when we face a type two diabetic patients with uh, diabetic macular edema, how do we proceed? So this is a treatment algorithm which uh, most of us uh, follow. I'm not going to detail. Coming to systemic uh, control, which is a paramount uh, role, it can be easily remembered as A, B, C. A stands for uh, HbA1c, anemia, B for blood pressure control, C for control of cholesterol, creatinine. And this is what I designed uh, to, uh, to counsel my patients of diabetic macular edema. D stands for discipline in lifestyle, diet, uh, to trust your doctor, M for medication, meditation, motivation, E for uh, education, exercise, and entertainment. So assessing a non-perfusion of retina is very important in uh, recalcitrant uh, DMEs. Any large area of peripheral uh, retinal non-perfusion, despite prior uh, PRP are associated with the more refractive DME. So obtaining an angio and applying a targeted retinal photocoagulation to the region of non-perfusion may help in control of uh, recalcitrant uh, macular edema. So some of the clinical studies which are done on anti wedges bevacizumab has been used or bolt drcr.net packers read to rise write resolve restore uh, drcr.net studies have been done using uh, ranibizumab in uh, treatment of macular edema davinci is the one study where aflibercept has been used and proven to be effective in management of uh, macular edema so coming to the role of uh, inflammation, uh, inflammation has a protagonist role in uh, diabetic macular edema. It is important to acknowledge that uh, its role in fluid accumulation as inflammation occur earlier and before the macular edema. So early treatment can control the inflammation and prevent the development of uh, macular edema. 
So corticosteroid implant has a special role in treatment of uh, chronic DME. DME, as you know, may shift uh, from primarily a VEGF mediated process in acute stage to a inflammatory disease in a chronic stage. So corticosteroid mainly acts by stabilizing the red retinal barrier and downregulating the expression of VEGF and inhibiting the production of uh, prostaglandins and pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is the pre and post uh, images of a patient who has received a DEX implant. Like after uh, one, one and a half month, you can see there is a complete resolution of edema and restoration of uh, integrity of uh, retina. So combination of steroid and anti vegf has uh, effective in treatment of a recalcitrant uh, DME. This synergistic effect of the sustained release steroids may result in uh, fewer anti vegf injection and help to control the DME. So coming to laser, focal lasers have been largely replaced by anti vegf for the initial treatment of uh, foveal edema. However, whenever there is a non-foveal edema, you can always uh, treat it with uh, focal laser. A micropulse lasers have shown some of the promising results in treatment of uh, recalcitrant uh, DMEs. So what, uh, coming to vitrectomy per se, what are the indications when we consider vitrectomies? Whenever there is a taut posterior hyalide, or whenever there is a vitromacular traction and epiretinal membrane, along with a lot of foveal exudates, or when there is a, a little or no macular ischemia, we can consider a vitrectomy in managing uh, macular edema. So how vitrectomy works? It relieves the anterior posterior as well as tangential traction. It relieves the vitreoxysis and removes the numerous vasopamil factors like VEGF, ICAM, interleukin-6. And uh, vitrectomy increases the oxygenation of the vitreous cavity almost up to 10 times. So PRP done at the time of uh, vitrectomy also reduces uh, mid-peripheral ischemia which may reduce the production of uh, wedges and in terms of vascular permeability factors in the vitreous cavity. So these are the two small videos which uh, have been done in patients of uh, diabetic macular edema. You can see a thick ERM has been peeled. Uh, it's a BBT assisted uh, ILM peeling, which has been performed here. And this is one more video showing the ILM peeling. You can see a lot of exudations in here in patients with uh, macular edema. The ILM peeling in case of macular edema is quite uh, tricky because of the stickiness of uh, ILM. It is not as easier as in what we see in cases of uh, macular holes. So these are the pre and post uh, of, uh, images of the patient who underwent uh, vitrectomy for uh, recalcitrant uh, macular edema, where you can see uh, post-op, you can see the complete uh, resolution as well as the restoration of integrity of uh, macula. So to conclude, so whenever you face a patient of uh, recalcitrant DME, tailored therapy is uh, very much uh, important so that you can have a targeted treatment aiming at uh, multiple pathways. You need to individualize uh, mm -hmm. the therapy for uh, better outcomes. So how do you tailor? You can tailor the therapy based on some of the ocular factors, like in presence of uh, glaucoma or any high IOP, uh, and based on the amount of ischemia you have, or uh, looking into the lens status. So some of the non ocular factors which you consider are uh, presence of uh, systemic disease and uh, compliance to follow. So, in a nutshell, the final thoughts recalcitrant DME is a complex condition. Effective therapy requires the application of several strategies targeting different pathological mechanisms in uh, DME. Individualized treatment plans may be needed. Posterior highlight management is uh, vital to understand control and treatment of uh, chronic condition. The randomized control trial on refractory DME and combined therapeutic strategies are essential. Newer drug development help us to target additional mediators in DME cascade. Uh, last genetic markers may help us to create a personalized uh, treatment. Thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you, sir. Um, would like upon to ask uh, our uh, no, master of uh, um, Dr. Jacob, who is well versed with all the studies. Jacob, what would you advise a patient with uh, you know chronic persistent DME? You have given three injections. Are you shifting to six injections as per the protocol? I or you want to um, you know maintain a three injection and switch injections between between classes or between groups of drug. Jack, Jacob, can you hear me? Hello. Pradeep, what, what's your take on that? If financial issue is not a concern, then only like... No, don't, don't consider it. Don't consider it. It's, it's an issue with all of us, I know. But as such, uh, based upon the studies, if you want to you know, go ahead with studies per se and follow them verbatim, so what would you want to do? You uh, do you want to switch I, classes, I would, group of drugs? Would, not just not not three, sir. Even at two, maybe I would think of switching. I am not very keen on persisting. Like I am not very persistent in continuing the same injection. Uh, two things. One, like as the edema continues to be chronic, uh, there is definite loss of uh, the retinal uh, outer layer. The retinal structures keep getting uh, damaged over time. So like. Uh, if we don't have any option, it's fine. Like we have to go with one, we, have, we will go with that. But if there is an option, why not to try is what I always feel like. If there is an option, I try to do whatever I can do to decrease the edema as early as possible rather than persisting with the same injection based on the results of the study. I do agree, like uh, studies have shown that like uh, if we are persistent with the injection at the end, the results are good. But over a short term, even to keep the patient confidence, like it's difficult to they continue with the persist with the same injection. Like as I already told, it may not be three. Even after two injections, if I find like it's not working, I would try to switch. I'm not very keen on continuing with the same injection. So, so are we looking at any OCT changes like the hyperluminosity inside the cyst cavities to say it is uh, you no know, too very chronic, or if the fluid is not very hyperlucent, uh, can we consider still uh, you know be a little bit less aggressive? and keep giving the same injection or something like that. Uh, what's your take on that? There are a few studies like which have analyzed the uh, reflectivity of uh, the intraretinal fluid yes. and the subretinal fluid. The, if, the, mm -hmm. high, if the reflectivity is hyper, like if the cysts are more uh, uh, turbid looking and uh, if you see that yes. there's hyper reflectivity, it has been noted that their response might be better to uh, steroids rather than anti But uh, there are only oh, like, uh, of, like, like when I last night, mm -hmm search maybe like I found only two studies but both like uh, had shown that uh, steroids were better. Okay that's what I wanted to. Uh, Manjunath sir uh, what about IVTA? Uh, how many patients um, as such in a real world scenario would you inject IVTA and how is the response do you feel? Do you have any patients who had uh, resistance to IVTA as of now? No no to be frank I have not seen any patient who are resistant to IVTA. That's what mainly because of the fear factor and uh, might, might be some other things. So we are shifted uh, not using IVTA often. But still, I uh, personally feel that that should be a, a option whenever before switching to any other medicine. So I would share the same uh, you know platform because whenever the patient uh, we have injected anti VEGF or we have shifted from anti VEGF to Osodex or primary we are given Osodex and very few number of patients have not responded to Oxidex in my clinical practice and, and I've given IVTA and they responded beautifully. The reason they say that the entire injection is dumped, the entire you know molecules is dumped into it and that's the larger amount of molecules which are available for acting. That That's the reason why they respond. So is the side effect also very high in IVTA as compared to others. Thank you, Some sir. Patients, so we have used almost up to 8 milligrams of IVTA. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there has been a surprise, like I had a one-to-one -one conversation with Jonas. So he said that he has given a concentrated almost about 24 uh, milligrams. And he says the yeah, side effects as such is very minimal and uh, not much of uh, glaucoma in these patients also. That's what he quoted, but we are all afraid of even 4 milligrams. Forget about giving 24 milligrams as such, which is six times more. But he says that literally the edema goes completely dries up and for nearly about six to eight months, it doesn't come back. So I don't know. I, I mean, I don't. Any of us would have even dared to try it. What uh, I feel is glaucoma is better than uh, macularity. 
what would you say pradeep yeah. pradeep what would you say sir say take is glaucoma is uh, managing glaucoma is better than uh, dme no we have better uh, medications we can manage uh, i know i know i know so i know i know i know difficult like i i actually give only 2 mg 4 mg is only for resistant cases i go to 4 i give only 2 mg ivt in most of my patients uh, where even like there are like uh, prospective studies even available which says that 2 mg does well and definitely the risk of iop rise is low and uh, considering Lower. that we have two surgeons and like two medical like two people who practice and one of my senior colleague gives 4 mg and i give 2 mg and uh, Uh, like we have comparison also like i personally i am happy with the results with 2 mg uh, so the only yeah. reason only issue with giving a lower dosage is it's not anything because we presume that a lower uh, you know uh, formula of that uh, ready made available uh, ivta as 2 mg but uh, it it has more of solvent also we don't precipitate the solute and then we give so what happens is the drug concentration though it is given in a bolus uh, the longevity is much shorter would you agree in that or would you say that it works for nearly 8 to 10 weeks still no I'm giving to the 2 mg only two case, like two cases i had in which the like initial response was good and they persisted for roughly around 10 to 10 weeks at least in almost all the cases except for two cases still not in which mm-hmm. i have shifted to 4 mg but uh, a uh, long it like uh, the comparison between the studies like like the comparison between 2 mg 4 mg most of most of the studies haven't looked into this how frequently the injection would be required and uh, okay. uh, how free, how what is the longevity of an injection but uh, that's one thing which we are evaluating in a prospective study as of now like uh, we are seeing like quite frequently so that we will be able to see like whether these patients have a like uh, the effect of ivt a last for a lesser duration or not but no, as okay. of now without analyzing uh, and are doing a proper study whatever i have noted is like long ivt is also not, not a major state. is not okay. major issue. thanks pradeep thanks for that insight so let's go to the next talk uh, it's by none other than dr vivek pastor Vivek sir is my senior from the same alumnus. Um, he is not only a teacher to us uh, as far as retina is concerned. He has lo- uh, taught us lot on uh, how to lead upon life. Also, a very good human being. So, Vishal, can you please upload? Sir is not here. He has he has some other commitment. Can you upload his video? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Doctor Vivek, I am a senior consultant at Shri Hospital. I would be talking to you about a fairly common disorder called as diabetic retinopathy, but not about the usual presentation. Uh, in our practice, we would have encountered situations wherein our patients who have been with us for a very long time suddenly tend to progress in terms of diabetic retinopathy, which is not in corroboration with their diabetic retinopathy levels or diabetes levels either. So, in those uh, kind of scenarios, how should what should be our approach? is what i would probably want to uh, want to share with you people uh, so first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, our uh, our host today that is the karnataka ophthalmic society and the scientific committee chairman dr uh, uh, ln kumaran as well as the moderator of this uh, particular session uh, dr rajesh who is a dear friend of mine who, who has given me this opportunity to uh, share my experience in this particular topic so i would start off sh- sharing with this presentation so i'll present a few case scenarios straight away so here here is a 54 year old diabetic who presents to us with a complaints of floaters in the left eye associated with third vision since the last few days He's been a diabetic for the last seven years, and his last dilated retinal evaluation was done elsewhere, uh, which showed no gross, gross retinopathy changes. He had a printout of uh, the fundus photograph image that was done there, and there was obviously uh, no diabetic retinopathy changes. Even not a, a few micro aneurysms could be detected on the print that uh, that I received. So. Uh, in in May 2021, he was diagnosed as that is around seven months back. He was diagnosed as a, a diabetic nephropathy and has been on twice weekly dialysis since then. So as we see here in the left eye, he has a bleeding new vessel with uh, subhyoid hemorrhage. Also, he has a few 
mu vessels on right eye as well. Coming to this second patient, who is a 75 year old known diabetic, who has been with us for the last 22 years, and uh, his PRB laser was done 10 years back. He's been under regular follow up, no complaints. He was diagnosed to have a cataract with la stable laser PDR in July 2021. He underwent cataract surgery in September and he had regained good vision in the range of 612 to 69 in both the eyes. He presented to us in late October with blurred vision in the left eye. As we see, the right eye uh, retina appears to be quite well lasered and his vision in that eye is around 69 parts. In the left eye, what was around 69 has dropped down to around 3 by 60 with the uh, engorged uh, veins and uh, retinal hemorrhages in all the quadrants with severe macular edema and OC. Obviously, this is a central retinal vein occlusion uh, superimposed on the pre-existing PDR. The third scenario is, a, is that of a 58-year-old known diabetic and hypertensive who has been well controlled. He has been under regular uh, checkup with no diabetic retinopathy for the past two, three years. He presents with third vision and inability to work on computer since the three months, last three months, and he uh, somehow thought that he was having a cataract and came for evaluation. His vision was around six nine parts. His near vision was more affected. It was end and despite correction. The fundus showed three papillary retinal hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. Very few microaneurysms were detected, not corroborating with the extent of uh, cotton wool spots. And uh, checking his blood pressure was around two twenty by one forty. And uh, the OCT showed diffuse uh, retinal edema with very mild uh, neurosensory detachment. He was referred to the physician straight away. He came back to us three months later with better glycemic uh, control and blood pressure control. Physically also he was feeling quite better. But the difficulty in fine print uh, persists. An OCT revealed a bigger neurosensory detachment and anti of treatment was given and he kind of settled off. Way back, uh, now we'll go to the next uh, case scenario, which uh, in July 16, uh, 2016, we found a uh, 56-year-old diabetic who came to us with mild blurred vision and in, uh, with the range of 612 to 6'9". He had a lot of uh, retinal hemorrhages all over with the macular edema and OCT like this. So, somehow I felt that this is not a typical diabetic retinopathy with uh, macular edema. There has to be some other abnormality. So, he was... Uh, sent for a general physical examination with his physician and endocrinologist and uh, was asked to remain under observation because he has he had reasonably good vision. He came back to me two weeks later with complaints of further blurred vision with the vision dropping to 624 and 618. Uh, and as we see here, the OCT show, uh, reveals uh, more of a neurosensory detachment rather than intra-retinal edema. And uh, this time I insisted for a rheumatologic workup as well which turned out to be normal then without any other goals so the palatia was uh, given eccentrics was given to twice so six to seven months later he came back with generalized weakness and tiredness and on uh, evaluation he was found to have a hemoglobin level of 6.5 which was quite alarming and uh, hematologic consultation was done which revealed uh, uh, um, uh, bone marrow aspiration was done which revealed a diagnosis of multiple myeloma and he was started on chemotherapy from. So this was the OCT at that point in time. So these were different uh, case scenarios which uh, which were like out of the box. Generally, as we see, the natural history of diabetic retinopathy has been elucidated by various uh, uh, long-term studies. So a prominent one would be a, a WESDR, that is Wisconsin Epidemiology Study of Diabetic Retinopathy. Well, the 25-year cumulative incidence of any retinopathy is around 83%, any macular edema is around 29%, CSME is around 70%, and PDR is around 42%. And the major factors being glycosylated hemoglobin, obviously, the level of uh, hypertension and smoking. And off late, in the last five years, the annualized incidences of all of these seem to be dipping because of better glycemic control due to various new drugs. This is what WESDR says. So, how do you characterize a sudden progression of diabetic retinopathy? You probably sees a quick change from non-proliferative to proliferative. You've been seeing this patient for like six, seven years. The patient has been stable uh, with a mild to moderate FPDR. And suddenly you see that there are florid new results. There is an appearance of severe macular edema, typically with a large neurosensory detachment. Patient complains of vague uh, symptoms where uh, it's more like difficulty in near vision, inability to recognize faces. Uh, reading difficulties and things like that, rather than specific complaint of third vision. 
and there can be an association of reasonably good uh, glycemic control as well. When we dilate these patients and check, we probably find out is a unusually florid and aggressive neurism. There could be a large foveal neurosensory detachment. There could be widespread uniformly distributed retinal hemorrhages and a visual lacuity not corroborating with the fundus picture. Either the vision is extremely bad or the vision is in the range of 6 plus 6 9 with widespread retinal hemorrhages and severe uh, ne large neurosensory detachments. And there is a relatively less intraretinal retina. So, first let's rule out the local causes, which could be due to a recent difficult cataract surgery. A superimposed retinal vascular occlusion, like I showed you earlier, could be a recurrent deviators, the, the inflammation causing uh, macular edema and stuff like that. But what is more important, uh, particularly for the uh, lifespan of the patient, would be uh, the other systemic factors, which could be uh, progression to diabetic nephropathy, uncontrolled hypertension, as I showed you in one of the patients, hematologic disorders, and even uh, various treatments like the pioglitazone or the glitazones, or more specifically thiazolidinediones, they can cause in a known patient who has been having diabetic retinopathy when it has been initiated later for better glycemic control is known to cause extracellular edema and worsening of the condition. Or transretinoic acid or ATRA, which is used in, to, in the induction of some of the leukemias like acute promyelocytic leukemia. Some of the immunosuppressive agents like imatinib also are known to cause sudden progression of the In our experience, we might have encountered some unfortunate patients who immediately after a CABG tend to progress uh, from uh, non-NPDR to PDR. Uh, and sometimes they can also have uh, uh, non-arthritic uh, ischemic optic neuropathy. Sometimes they can even present to us with intractable uh, neovascular glaucoma. So, of course, well, once we rule out, sometimes the patients may come to us with the proper history. Many a times we might have to uh, actually probe deeper to diagnose them. So, uh, coming to the hematologic disorders, which are reasonably common and what we expect it to be. So, in an adult, probably we should first have the chronic myeloid leukemia as our DD, followed by acute leukemia. And there could also be these other uh, hemoglobinopathies and uh, like multiple myeloma, polycythemia and things like that. Holden Strong's uh, macroglobulinemia and things like that. There could also be uh, hypertriglyceridemia, which is fairly common in the metabolic syndrome, uh, which could be either familial or due to acute pancreatitis or post hematopoietic stem, uh, stem cell transplantation. This is typically characterized by what, is, what we see as lipemia retinalis, where you see a huge amount of uh, exudation and uh, hard exudates, both intravascular as well as perivascular and in the retina. So, uh, we, we have to rule this out by uh, conducting various tests and uh, uh, suggesting adequate and uh, appropriate referrals to the uh, concerned specialist and uh, give them a proper image or a proper uh, picture of what is happening and uh, what you are looking at. Because this communication, interdisciplinary communication is very crucial for the patient to uh, get into a, a quicker diagnosis and probably it could end up uh, saving their lives as well. So, as we know, uh, I just want to highlight a few uh, issues that have, I mean, are the uh, few points that I would like to take you, uh, I mean, take you, you people should take home, which is that diabetic retinopathy is generally a slowly progressive disease. Sudden progression needs more detailed evaluation, both locally as well as systemically. Ocular signs might be the first manifestation of a more widespread and devastating systemic disease. And ocular disease might also be a sign of disease progression or latency of disease, like in terms of leukemias. The, the cells which are uh, nested in the eye could be a sign for recurrence or relapse. So, we need to identify any signs of recurrence or relapse and probably not only diagnose it, even treat it locally as well. And many a times the diagnosis might not be obvious uh, at, uh, at the outset, like in one of the uh, patients that I presented. We have to be at it. We have to keep repeating the tests. Uh, uh, what do you call? Trust your gut feeling, and also discuss with the concerned specialist, and uh, try to uh, reveal the diagnosis at the earliest. So this is what I wanted to share with you people. I again thank um, KOS for uh, giving me this opportunity. I hope uh, thanks for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. Um, would like to add upon. Sir, I had already advised uh, rheumatological opinion in one of the patients. So I have seen uh, 
lupus patients as well as thrombocytopenia patients, uh, you know, rapidly progressing. Anything to add upon Manjunath sir, Pradeep sir, Jacob? Yeah, yes, sir. That's what. Uh, remember that uh, uh, slow and uh, symmetrical progression is the most important. So whenever we see any rapid progression or whenever there is an asymmetry in the disease, I think that should uh, give you a clue that something we need to really go back and uh, look upon the history, something we are missing. In the Anything the out of the box patient uh, which you you could share like uh, that's what enlisted uh, retinal vein occlusion in AI1 or uh, you know rheumatoid rheumatology uh, evaluated patient SLE or uh, you know blood can leukemia cancers and thrombocytopenia anything else that you want to add up on to the list uh, where you have seen a patient with DR who suddenly progressed. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh -huh. Like it's not, uh, it's not uh, like uh, concomitant, like I had two cases. One was actually a, uh, he was in the case of diabetic retinopathy, but had mm -hmm. more SRF and very minimal IRF. And uh, okay. uh, atherosclerosis and angiography showed a picture like chronic CSC. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when there is more SRF than IRF, we have to consider uh, uh, to look at like, uh, is there anything like it's not very for common. Something like this for sure. It's not very common, but uh, uh, we had one example in which actually like initially he, he was treated with uh, uh, anti-VEGF earlier some uh, somewhere else, and uh, when we saw like uh, there was um, SRF more, IRF was there. Not that there was no IRF, but it was very like it was disproportionately more SRF, and uh, we had more of a feature like. Uh, chronic CSC and FFA and uh, so FFA would be indicated when SRF is more than uh, the intraretinal fluid and one more case in which actually there was a CNV. The CNV was mm -hmm. not evident on clinical examination but on OCT like we could see that uh, there was a type uh, 1 CNV. Uh, in okay. such cases it can be sometimes it may be present it may not be the responsible for everything so angiography in that case again if we see leak from that area, so it confirms that yeah. it would be the culprit. Okay, okay, well taken. So if we have time, uh, shall we go with the last presentation of mine? I don't know. I have not done any justice to it because I am not a cataract surgeon. But despite that, I have uh, you know collected whatever uh, info that I could get um, because I was asked to do it. I was forced to do it. That's what I could say. Is that okay? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Um, Vishal, uh, can you kindly uh, share my video, please? Hello, everyone. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Anand Kumar for this opportunity. The topic uh, for the day is uh, cataract surgery with diabetic macular edema. The primary question that comes to our mind is why is this topic discussed so often? So let us look into some of the important landmark studies which gave us an insight into this problem. Like in non-diabetics, the amount of cortical cataract that was approximately about 22% as compared to patients who had diabetes, which ranged anywhere from 35% to 65%. So the incidence of cataract and the related loss of vision is very common in our diabetic patients. Various aspects is increased, increased incidence and worsening of the pre-existing diabetic macular edema, increased incidence of Irwin gas syndrome, poor pupillary dilatation and its complication intraoperatively, occurrence of neovascular of the iris and worsening in the postoperative period. Macular edema after cataract surgery, when we looked in depth with the DRCR network, they came up with certain major outcomes and measures. They looked into the development of central involving macular edema. With non-central involving diabetic macular edema, the risk of uh, you know, developing CIDME, if there is no history of DME treatment in the previous, there was a 4% incidence. But if a patient had a previous treatment of DME, there was a 21% increase in the next 16 weeks in the post-operative period. So this is astonishing because most of our patients fall into the second category. So it becomes very important for us to give due importance to patients who have uh, diabetic macular edema and cataract and how to approach them to prevent further loss of vision. So let us look into a few salient points, how to approach a patient with diabetic retinopathy with visual loss, which is attributable to the cataract the patient has. So these patients can be divided into two groups, either the fundus is seen or the fundus is not seen. Let us look into each of them. So if the fundus of a patient is seen and we have noted the patient has a CIDME, then we need to go ahead with the anti-vegemo steroid implant 
which helps in clearing of the central involving lamptic matter edema and later and upon some amount of laser to prevent its recurrence. We wait till the edema regresses for approximately about three months and then we can plan the cataract surgery with explained prognosis of the recurrence of the macular edema. If the fundus is not seen, then we need to have a combined approach. So we extract the cataract and intraoperatively we see the fundus and evaluate it if the patient has a central involving diabetic macular edema. If a patient has so, then it is better to combine the surgery with certain anti or steroid to help prevent further aggravation of this macular edema. Indications for considering cataract surgery in a diabetic patient include a significant impairment of the visual acuity because there is some amount of early progression as compared to the peer age group and opacities which precludes the fundus evaluation of these patients with, you know, which also necessitate for diagnosing whether the patient has non-proliferative, proliferative and if at all we have given treatment or to treat these patients and to follow up the patients who have diabetic retinopathy and DM. Cortical cataract impair visualization of the fundus even before causing any significant visual loss. So it's more of a surgeon or the clinician's criteria to do a cataract surgery rather than the patient because the patient is comfortable with his vision. If there is a significant uh, refractive error changes, we often have patients who are in diabetics who come up with you know repeatedly changing uh, refractive error. Other complications such as when during a vitrectomy or laser procedure if the cataract has formed then we need to um, you know advise the patient to undergo a cataract surgery. Let us look into a small portion of why the cataract uh, develops in diabetic so early. So if there is increased glucose in the body the allose reductase converted into sorbitol. This sorbitol once which enters into the lens is entrapped. This causes an osmotic gradient of the aqueous to come into the lens, thereby forming a vacuole uh, and swelling of the uh, lens, thereby leading to distortion of the fibrils and cataract formation. Let us look into the operative consideration uh, of a patient who has uh, diabetic macular edema or diabetic retinopathy. On the day of surgery, systemic, we have to withhold all the oral hypoglycemics because we don't want the patient to develop hypoglycemia on the surgical table, we need to adjust the insulin dosage again for the same reason to prevent hypoglycemic attacks. Since the pupillary dilatation is a bit of a problem, so patients have to be dilated with topicomide 0.5% with phenylephrine 2.5%. It is better started at home just before they leave and to be continued till they arrive to the station. Topical NSAIDs before and after surgery mitigate the occurrence of CME and thereby keep the vision abreast. Intraoperative consideration, we need to have a good prophylactic surface antibiotics. Uh, the best would be a 5% bovine iodine, which has to be applied at least three times before we take up for the surgical intervention. At the uh, time of incision, a copious irrigation has to be done to make sure all the covidin is washed away, otherwise it might cause an intraocular inflammation. Minimal trauma with very watertight incision has to be placed. Type of surgery, um, it depends upon the surgeon, but as far as the literature is concerned, phacoemulsification is the best option in these patients to consider. It has least fare and AC reaction. The CCC size is quite large. It has to be placed because it may lead on to capsule phimosis in the later part of the postoperative period. Continuing with the intraoperative consideration, a very good viscoelastic which helps to protect the endothelium is essential because polymechanism and poly pleomorphism are very much positively associated with patients with diabetes mellitus even if they don't have a uh, um, patient uh, with uh, diabetic retinopathy. The cell density is significantly lower in patients with established diabetic retinopathy and more so when the patient is having a proliferative diabetic problem in his eyes. Adequate rexes to prevent capsule phimosis in the longer run has to be kept in mind. Hydrophobic lenses are the most preferred lenses compared to the others. Let us look into one of the common complications which are associated with the uh, diabetic retinopathy, that's the Irwin gas syndrome. Let us look into the signs and symptoms of these patients. Patients who had initially good vision in the post-operative period usually manifest of complaints of metamorphosis and blurry vision by around four to six weeks. When we look into the fundus, there is a loss of foveal reflex. A OCT shows a clear disruption of the parafoveal capillary arcade and cystoid spaces in the deep capillary plexus. Fundus fluorescein angiography cleanses the diagnosis. It includes retinal 
philangiectic blood vessels, capillary dilatation, leakage from the peripheral capillaries, and a petaloid um, hypofluorescent dot in the later stage. This is in the form of uh, topical NSIDs, which includes ketorolac, diclofenac, bromofenac, and nethofenac can be used. NSIDs can has been shown to decrease established CME also. If not, steroids as a monotherapy or in combination of NSIDs can also be tried. Other treatment uh, regimens include periocular steroids, intravitreal trimsolone if there is no good response to topical NSIDs or steroids. The only issue being is the raised IOP which has to be watched out for. Oral carbohydrate anhydrase inhibitors has also been shown to have some response. Immunomodulators and surgical uh, yard vitrolysis are of last resource and uh, it's not uniform. So let's consider one of my patients, 61 year old gentleman was diagnosed with irvin gas, three doses of anti was given elsewhere, uh, post-operative uh, topical steroids had increased IOPs, uh, that's why the anti was given. Vision acuity at presentation was 618 and 10, post shows gross CME. Oral steroids were started in these patients, there was some kind of a response with uh, decrease in the CME and NSD, but it recurred once we stopped the oral steroids. So we went ahead with injection of IBTA, showed very good response with complete resolution. And there was a recurrence about a, two months later, a second IVTA was given and CME decreased, but EMM was noted to slowly develop. So ultimately a vitrectomy with EMM peeling was done on February 2021 and post operative two months, the vision remained stable at 6, 6 and N8. Thank you. Any doubts or clarifications needed in that presentation? I know I have not done a very you know justifiable job, but despite that, whatever I could summarize. Manjunath, sir, any anything you want to add upon Pradeep, Jacob? Yeah, that was a nice uh, presentation, sir. <laughs> Actually, uh, being a retina surgeon, we all would love to see all diabetic patients with uh, photophagia rather than uh, having them with uh, lens. And we uh, we don't have much of the options. Uh, I'm saying we uh, tend to avoid using steroids or being them the lens later. So I feel like more after the age of 50 or somewhere, if you have some amount of uh, background diabetic retinopathy, we always con can consider them uh, for uh, cataract surgery rather than waiting for it to progress and uh, then they develop uh, macular edema or any diabetic retinopathy where uh, even the treatment is very difficult. So uh, I think nowadays we can always shift for early cataract extraction mm -hmm. rather than uh, waiting. That's what I personally okay. feel. I was totally surprised when I looked into the DRCR net uh, results saying that if at all some kind of a treatment was given to these patients with DME, there's about 22% risk, uh, you know, the patient having recurrence. Um, I don't know whether it's a, uh, you know, pharmaceutically driven thing that they're concluding that since 22% are giving, so it's better to give a prophylactic injection at the time of surgery, even if the patient doesn't have uh, any DME to begin with. Uh, Pradeep, you want to add anything to that? Uh, what do you feel? Uh, would you advise such a thing? No, sir. Like uh, maybe my threshold for giving injection is uh, lower when there is an association, when it's planned for cataract surgery. Maybe a, uh, an edema which I would observe, like uh, a very few cystoid spaces in the peripheral space, or like uh, like by if you go by protocol, we like it, it's very well discussed now that uh, if the vision is good, we can observe DME. That's what is. The result, but uh, in patients with cataract, we cannot say like what is the vision. It's completely we don't. The vision loss can be mainly due to True. cataract, and we never know like whether it's due to DME. So in such cases, uh, maybe like even a minimal edema, I would plan injection. But without edema, definitely I will not go ahead with injection, sir. And if it's not a center involving <laughs> edema, and I think it's uh, uh, amenable to focal laser, and focal laser can be done. Because of uh, because it's the cataract is not yeah, much, I would probably do a focal laser and then go ahead with cataract surgery. But uh, if I feel that uh, the cataract is significant enough and cannot do focal laser, I would probably do a surgery and doesn't don't wait for uh, uh, like uh, any progression. I would go ahead with focal laser once the media is better and at least two three weeks after cataract surgery. Sometimes I would have I have done. That. But prophylactic uh, NSAID is something which uh, I uniformly give for every patient of not just DME, even in any case of diabetic, need not be DR okay. also, because there is sufficient evidence to say that uh, prophylactic nepofenac uh, 
is helpful in patients is in preventing pseudophagic cme in patients with diabetes so a diabetic with uh, uh, planning for a cataract surgery i usually request the cataract surgeons to add um, like uh, totally agree with you uh, totally consent there's no ambiguity about that but again uh, which uh, which sorry nsids you want to do because um, as far as my knowledge is concerned whenever i've seen the longest and the, the most uh, you know class one evidence that was there was with ketorolac uh, what was your take uh, since nepafenac has been widely pushed by alcon is it that you know you want to nepafenac to be added or any nsids is the same what is your take on that to be frank i am not very sure about uh, comparison sure about it uh, um in said is but uh, a comparison between 0.1% versus 0.3 empafenac is something which uh, we are conducting a study on like uh, mm. in uh, patients with diabetic retinopathy and cataract yeah the single mm-hmm. dose uh, epafenac 0.3% versus 0.1% comparisons we are we are uh, we have a prospective study going on uh, we would like to see the results and then we may be able to uh, speak about it better but right now like in comparing different nsids like uh, i don't have much experience or i haven't uh, uh, read through like uh, i may i'm not be aware of it i would will go through it okay. Uh, if there if there's any comparison i will have to go through i'm not very sure sir any last words because i think uh, we are the only four people sitting over here or three of us at edic and one at bill so anything else that you want like to add a wonderful session i did learn uh, especially two new things from manjunath sir i said recalcitrant diabetic macular may he got the uh, you know the meaning of recalcitrant <laughs> thanks for that and dme uh, in addition to abc so that uh, we educate our patients much better uh, to reemphasize on uh, diabetic control and make sure that uh, they don't have a recurrence rather than keep treating uh, dme as such thanks for that so wonderful uh, talk that i could uh, summary and pradeep sagar as usual uh, positive findings i have looked deeper so whatever your thought is let me uh, try to put it into clinical practice and see what i can do best with my patients anything else as last words pradeep manjunath sir anything else that you want to add up on Now, thank you, sir. We had a wonderful discussion. Like, yeah, absolutely. So See, it's all, time is all the limit. I was repeatedly asking the admin, is there any other you know group which is waiting or any other person who wants to log in? But thankfully, nothing else. So we have uh, crossed about ten minutes uh, more than what the time was allotted. But I think it was a nice fair, you, uh, fair enough. I suppose so. Same, same over here. Uh, Pradeep, anything else that you want to add upon? Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. it was a so he, nice he was just saying that just just shut it that's it <laughs> leave me i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you you had a busy schedule <laughs> i i have been you know i don't know how many sessions i have attended i think i'm totally yeah, yeah. tired <laughs> just... yeah thank you thank you guys thanks a lot thanks a lot meet you soon bye both of you soon bye bye bye, bye.